No. Oh, there we go. All right. So my talk is on truth, uh, in defense of truth as participation. Uh, it's a proposal, a uh, process philosophical proposal. You'll, you'll note if you've seen the, the uh, program, the schedule that uh, Carolyn, who's going last, uh, her talk is titled In Defense of Fiction. But um, we've conferred in advance and actually they're both totally compatible with one another. And uh, that should uh, become clear. I'm often referred to and called a, a Whiteheadian philosopher, but uh, having studied Whitehead for uh, almost two decades, I know I look young, but I've been at this for a while. Um, I think that would really disappoint Whitehead that there was such a thing as a Whiteheadian. Um, I'm, I'm not uh, resistant to process philosopher as a title. Um, and I obviously do love Whitehead's thought, um, but I think, um, yeah, to be pigeonholed in that way is something that I resist. I remember Cornell West once, uh, who I love to hear lecture, uh, talked about the narrow specializations that academic philosophers get into. And he loves Whitehead too, but he said, a Whiteheadian, how narrow? And I was like, oh, he, that hit me. So process philosopher, please. Thank you. Ian's The Matter With Things, uh, two volumes, each about eight pounds each. Uh, volume one, The Ways to Truth. Volume two, What Then Is True. And so I couldn't help but, there they are. I couldn't help but, uh, but really try to, to zoom in and zoom out in one gesture on this topic of truth. And I'm gonna do so from uh, a process philosophical point of view, but before we even get into the topic, it's important to remember um, what Rabbi, Rabbi Jacob Agus says here that Ian quotes in chapter 10, truth is a noun only to God. To men and women, truth is really best known as an adverb, truly. So as a way of setting the scene here, Sure. As a way of setting the scene here, I want to quote Whitehead. Um, so we get a sense for truth and the partiality of our perspective upon truth, right? So he says, philosophy has to rescue the facts as they are from the facts as they appear. We view the sky at noon on a fine day. It is blue, flooded by the light of the sun. The direct fact of observation is the sun as the sole origin of light and the bare heavens. The sky is blue. True statement, right? Whitehead continues, conceive the myth of Adam and Eve in the garden on the first day of human life. They watch the sunset, the stars appear. And lo, creation widened to man's view. The excess of light, he concludes, discloses facts and also conceals them. So we are finite creatures. This is a defense of truth. And yet as finite creatures, we can only ever have a partial perspective on the capital T truth, right? We know truly who can hold the truth for us, right? You, you, me, no, no. We can't hold the truth with a capital T as individuals, we must all hold it together, all of the partial perspectives together. And who are we all together? And not just human beings in a pan experientialist sense. Who are we all together? Well, Whitehead had a, had a word for that. Uh, it's been around for a while. Um, he called it God. Whitehead's God is not some kind of divine dictator. He even denies that God is a creator. God for Whitehead is a creature, the first creature of what he calls creativity, but nonetheless a creature. So rather than creator, I would say for Whitehead, God is a relator with a capital R. God is the relator. And I have to add here, uh, if Mike is listening, um, 
you know, similarly, what does one cell know of truth, of the truth of our whole bodies? And what can all cells know together? Well, they know us, our consciousness, which literally means knowing together, right? And so we can see this analogy playing out. If Michael made that analogy earlier um, between the music of the brain, this neural symphony and the human being immersed in the, in the music of the spheres. So this is a very different approach to theology and also to truth. And I think it might at first uh, seem odd why um, I would immediately go to theology in order to understand this concept of truth, because in our day and age, we think of truth as something scientific. And in science, you don't make reference to the G word. <laughs> Footnotes to Plato. Um, Whitehead's comment is sometimes misquoted to make it sound a little stronger than it is. He says, the safest general characterization of the history of European philosophy is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. And then he goes on to make another qualifying statement, but it's often just quoted as all of philosophy is a, is a series of footnotes to Plato. But truth as participation is certainly a, a platonic idea. And the way that Whitehead articulates this is he says that the things which are temporal, that's us, arise by their participation in the things which are eternal, that's also us. Temporal actualities and eternal potentialities are mediated by this primordial divine entity. God as the relator between actuality and potentiality or God as the ideal realization of potentialities. For Whitehead constitutes the reason why we should be able to even do metaphysics at all, whether we try to do so propositionally or musically, whether we try to do so by letting the implicit remain implicit, showing and not telling, or whether we try, as he did, to write a 350-page book, Process and Reality, to spell out the eight categories of existence and the 27 categories of explanation. Is it 26 or 27? It's, it's, as Ian knows, uh, difficult to comprehend. Whitehead, the logician, he had two hemispheres and he uses them both. But the fact that there could even be such a thing as metaphysics for Whitehead suggests that there is this, uh, this ground, this divine ground, this ideal realization of potentialities and again, though for Whitehead, his process theology is such that we have to let go of the idea of God as a creator. God does not create the world. But Whitehead says, by the patient operation of the overpowering rationality of conceptual harmonization, God functions as the poet of the world. With tender patience, luring the world process toward ever deeper forms of truth, beauty, and goodness. So if and when we as finite creatures know the truth, we do so by, by partaking in this divine reality, in this divine relation. And in a creative cosmos, the thing is that the truth is never finished. You cannot state the truth once and for all. The truth is always becoming enriched by every new fact which emerges in the history of the world. Each new perspective as it concresses is his term, and I'll get into that. We're gonna do a very quick introduction to Whitehead's account of what concrescence is. It's, it's the production of novelty, to use the simplest phrase. But with each concrescence, with each emergent fact and value, because for Whitehead, that's two ways of describing the same thing, new truths are coming into the world. New propositions are coming into the world. And for Whitehead, a proposition is not just at the top of that stack that John Verbeke has described for us, he describes propositions as feelings which propagate through the world far below the level of our verbal human consciousness. And in fact, what we try to verbalize as a proposition is uh, almost, no, not almost, never containing the entirety of the subtlety of the propositional feeling that we're actually trying to refer to with a, a sentence in English or even in mathematics. So, I'm summarizing Whitehead here in this first bullet point where he says that truth is nothing more nor less than how the partial experiences of the many creatures of the physical world 
find adequate expression within the divine nature, which far from being frozen for all time, evolves in its relationship to the evolving world. And so when we think about truth, we need to go beyond just the scientific account of the facts, which is absolutely essential. We gotta get the facts right. But science itself is the expression of a value, is the expression of a, as Whitehead says in this third bullet point, uh, of a religious value, a religious interest, right? Philosophy frees itself from the taint of ineffectiveness, he says, and attains its chief importance by fusing religion and science into one rational scheme of thought. The demand for an intellectual justification of brute experience has been the motive power in the advance of science. In this sense, scientific interest is only a variant form of religious interest. Any survey of the scientific devotion to truth as an ideal will confirm this statement. Now, in the modern period, science and religion have gone their separate ways. And philosophy has given up on the attempt for the most part to fuse the two. Um, polemic is the name of the game in, in most philosophy departments when it comes to uh, adjudicating the relationship between science and religion. In his 1920 book, The Concept of Nature, Whitehead articulates what he called the bifurcation of nature. And this was one of the major moments when um, in the 17th century, the modern scientific method uh, was brought forth and articulated. All, all of the scientists who did articulate it were um, deists, and they wouldn't have even uh, imagined that the world might be rationally explainable and mathematically explainable if it had not been designed by an all-powerful deity. I mean, there was a direct connection uh, for Newton, even for Galileo, uh, for Descartes, that science is possible because the world is divinely ordered and our mind has been divinely created so as to know that order. Um, and there are certainly problems with the way that they formulated that, but we should never forget as a matter of historical um, development that science comes out of this scholastic theological philosophy that imagined there's an intelligible ground to nature. We would not have had science and mechanistic reductionism if it didn't come out of this origin, right? White, but Whitehead sees the problem here, this bifurcation of nature. It's not the same as Descartes' dualism between the thinking substance and the ex extended substance. It's a bit subtler than that. At this point, Whitehead wasn't yet doing metaphysics, right? This is the concept of nature, 1920. Process in reality is 1929. Uh, he's still uh, in England in 1920, and he's thinking about the philosophy of science and the way that science generally um, splits our experience of the world in two. There's the world described by mathematical physicists, which is a kind of mere conjecture. And then there's the world uh, described by nature poets and the world of our everyday experience, which has colors and scents and sounds. The world described by physics is merely mathematical. It has no value. It has no qualitative texture. Whitehead writes, what I'm essentially protesting against is the bifurcation of nature into two systems of reality, which insofar as they are real are real in different senses. One reality would be the entities such as electrons, which are the study of speculative physics. This would be the reality which is there for knowledge. Although on this theory, it is never known. For what is known is the other sort of reality, which is the byplay of the mind. Thus, there would be two natures. One, the conjecture, the other, the dream. So the byplay of the mind is all the, the qualitative richness of the world described by Wordsworth. And the reality which is therefore knowledge, but never known, because all we really know is our subjective little perspective that the romantics tried to glorify, but that the scientific perspective says is merely a secondary, a set of secondary characteristics projected by our organism. Nature out there is just matter in motion, but even in, 
you know, more advanced physics, it's just a formula, a, a formula describing a transition and it's transition in no reason of, we don't know what, we don't even know what matter is anymore. And so how do these two realities fit together? They're both real in some sense, but the way that the modern scientific project was inaugurated split them and it forgot that it had done so. What happens to truth after this bifurcation? Well, Whitehead describes what he calls the sensationalist doctrine. And it's this understanding of all knowledge of the external world uh, arising solely through the mediation of private sensations of our eyes, our ears. You've probably heard of qualia in the philosophy of mind. This is an idea shared by empiricists like Hume, <clears throat> rationalists like Descartes, and even transcendentalists like Kant who tried to bring empiricism and rationalism together in some sense. There's this assumption that the human mind knows about the world through the outward facing senses. And so what this amounts to in, in Hume's analysis, uh, especially, is that all experience of the external world is derived from and reducible to the isolated sensory impressions of bare universals, redness, you know, circularity, et cetera, a tone, music, provided by the five sense organs. Thus perception and cognition are cut off from the real causal transactions of the world. So causality becomes a major problem, right? If all we experience are these sense impressions, Hume pointed out, we have no evidence for necessary connection in nature, no evidence for causality. And so how is science even possible? So for Hume, what this meant is that causality is but a figment of our imagination. It's a function of our habits of perception and our customary associations of our impressions. And for Hume, an idea is not a form as Plato had it, but it's a faded impression. And even for Kant, uh, causality, not a habit, but it's, a, it's an a priori category, um, appended to, added to what is otherwise a chaotic swarm of sensations, a necessary condition, he would say, of any cognizable experience. So for Hume, causation is just a psychological association, has no purchase on the real world. And for Kant, it's a category that we must apply to our experience, but uh, we, we, we shouldn't, if we're careful Kantians, and it turns out even Kant himself slipped up here, we shouldn't be applying causality to, to a world out there independent of our minds. So what is the mind then? It's, it's in the business only of fabricating an inner picture of the world. It's leaving reality itself unknowable. And so we end up in a position where we're describing our experience as this secondary phenomenon of representations built up of sensory impressions. And we can't say what the actual entities might be behind the veil uh, that's shrouding us from them. So this is a screenshot of a, a YouTube uh, thumbnail from a, a channel called Big Think. And it, is reality real? They interview people like Donald Hoffman and Bernardo Castrup and, in different ways, they all suggest that uh, reality isn't real. What does that mean? Well, it means that we make it up in our heads, more or less. But Whitehead points out the problem here, um, because all the while, while Hume said that causality is just a psychological association, science went about producing instrumental knowledge that has transformed everything that we do. The technology works, and that's always the defense when scientists want to do you know, table banging defenses of, of realism, they say, well, it works. But epistemologically and philosophically, there's a problem here. And let me read what Whitehead says. The modern doctrine, the sensationalist doctrine I was describing, raises a great difficulty in the interpretation of modern science. For all exact observation is made in private psychological fields, right? We see something because it is, uh, light reaches our retina and goes to the, the back of the brain and it's a representation is created. This is all happening inside the skull. And Whitehead jokes in Science in the Modern World, his 1925 book, he says, some people express themselves as though brains and nerves and sense organs are the only real things in an entirely imaginary world. 
he continues in this quote here from Process and Reality, all exact observation is made in private psychological fields. It is then no use talking about instruments and laboratories and physical energy. What is really being observed are narrow bands of color sensa in the private psychological space of color vision. The impressions of sensation which collectively form this entirely private experience, he quotes Hume, arise in the soul from unknown causes. The spectroscope is a myth. The radiant energy is a myth. The observer's eye is a myth. The observer's brain is a myth. And the observer's record of his experiment on a sheet of paper is a myth. And he means myth in the pejorative sense of lie. He's not a Jungian. He's not speaking Jungian or Campbellian uh, here. When some months later he reads his notes to a learned society, he has a new visual experience of black marks on a white blackboard or a white uh, background in a new private psychological field. And again, these experiences arise in his soul from unknown causes. It is merely custom which leads him to connect his earlier with his later experiences. So philosophically, that's the situation that we're in if we take this sensationalist doctrine that the only points of contact we have with the external world are through the five basic senses. Now, um, Ian quotes Erwin Chargaff, um, the biochemist, quite often in his in his books, and uh, Chargaff says that the wise scientist will be aware of the eternal predicament that between him and the world there always is the barrier of the human brain. And I add here, yes, and every barrier is also a means of contact. And so the question is, how does Whitehead restore contact? And he develops a theory of perception where what we, what the philosophical tradition has thought of as our only point of contact with the world, which isn't actually a form of contact, it's always a representational simulation through the five senses. Whitehead calls that presentational immediacy. And he admits it's essential for making accurate measurements of the natural world as it exists in any given moment of our experience. Then there's this other mode of perception that he calls causal efficacy. Whereas Hume and Kant and other modern philosophers, uh, you know, Kant said that, well, causality must be a category we add to experience. And Hume says, oh, it's just a habit we add uh, that we build up through various experiences. But Whitehead says, wait a minute, Hume, you said we see with our eyes. And we, he, Hume says, we see with our eyes, the billiard ball hit the other billiard ball and nowhere do we see necessary connection. But Whitehead reminds him, you just said we see with our eyes. We have a direct feeling of causal transmission in our own living bodies. That's causal efficacy. And Whitehead points out that all modern philosophers have been obsessed with their visual experience and they have disdained their visceral experience. And his is a philosophy of emotion we heard earlier. It's a philosophy of feeling. Oh, I'm, I'm aware that this was a video and that's not gonna work. <laughs> Guess we don't get to learn about concrescence in 30 seconds. This is a diagram of concrescence, um, not animated. The basic process is um, the past growing together, the many finished actualities of the past grow together into a new subjective perspective. And then as soon as that subjective perspective that has turned the, the conflicting array of objects in its past into some new harmonization, brought conflicts into contrasts, it is an, a, an aesthetic satisfaction is achieved, which immediately then perishes. And that subjective perspective becomes what Whitehead calls a superject and it gifts itself to the future. It's made some new value of the past that then it hands off to the future. And there's a transition between concrescences and that those transitions are feelings. And this, this happens from the quantum scale on up for Whitehead. And he brings forth this novel category or concept of prehension, right? And, and prehension is this process of feeling whereby uh, the past grows together into a new subjective perspective, right? And we have physical prehensions of the past, which can be conformal if we repeat what has just occurred, or they can be non-conformal when some creativity enters and we adjust what we've received from the past. And as you move up the scale of complexity in nature, the capacity for adjustment which Whitehead would also call mind, gradually intensifies. And so the novelty that can be introduced by any given concrescence uh, increases if you're talking about um, the concrescences occurring in the uh, nervous system of a dolphin or of a human being. 
versus uh, the molecules that compose a, a, a rock. And with this concept of, of uh, prehension, the problems, Whitehead says, of efficient causation and of knowledge receive a common explanation. What does he mean by that? It means that this, the causal transmission of feelings through nature are of the same kind as our own understanding, which Whitehead says is a form of feeling itself. It's a form of feeling, of feeling, of feeling, a whole hierarchy of feelings that's uh, organized by our very complex bodies. But in terms of the metaphysical uh, principles at play, there is no difference between the causal transmission through the inorganic world and the feeling of what we call knowledge and consciousness in ourselves. Now, he's not saying that consciousness goes all the way down. Consciousness is this very special form of feeling that involves a comparison between the actually given past and a possibility. And again, as organisms become more complex, they can enter into that space of possibility uh, to adjust what they're receiving from the past, to, to explore alternatives. But it's all feeling. Whitehead will talk about physical feelings, inheriting from the past and conceptual feelings where we're drawing on possibilities. I need to wrap up here. So he says this transference of feeling affects a partial identification of cause with effect, right? Conformal feelings. It's not a mere representation of the cause. This process of prehensive unification, I'm very quickly trying to describe to you, is the accumulation of the universe and not a stage play about it. Physical feelings embody the reproductive character of nature and also the objective immortality of the past. Everything that happens is inherited by the next moment. Each moment of our experience includes the entirety of the universe which has come before us. Don't worry, you don't have to remember all of that inside your head. It's there, everywhere, right? Memory is, is non-local. <laughs> and so the take home here is that for Whitehead, the world itself is a medium for the transmission of feelings. Truth is a conformal feeling, feeling what was real then and there and what appears here and now. So the proposal here is that contrary to Ludwig Wittgenstein, who in his Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, published in 20, 1922, I believe, who said that the world is just the totality of facts, contrary to, to this claim, in Whitehead's view, the world is also composed of an infinity of forms. It's not just the totality of facts. And what is a form? A form is a possibility. So the world, in other words, is pregnant with possibilities. Whatever has actually occurred is haloed by a penumbra of unrealized potentials. We prehend, which could be a synonym for perceive, remember, think, not just what is, but what could be, right? The actual and the possible are held in relation by each moment of experience. So whether we're doing science, whether we're enraptured in some mystical experience, communing with the divine, our human finitude is going to prevent us from apprehending the truth in its entirety. And this isn't just a function of our biological and psychological limitations. It's, it's also because of our spiritual freedom to influence what may yet become true. The truth is a process. Even God doesn't know what's gonna happen next in Whitehead's process theology. And so we are, participa we are participants in making true what may not yet be true. So in this process view, the cosmos itself is an incomplete, open-ended cosmogenesis rather than a fixed order. We are incapable of any final apprehension of ultimate truth because human beings, as much as God and the world as a whole, remain unfinished and bound up in this reciprocal co-creative process. And I want to leave us with this one of the applications, implications of this, uh, the McGilchrist wager, um, which is building on Pascal's wager, which you've all probably heard before. Um, but 
with the McGilchrist version of this, rather than having to decide between the two propositions, either God exists or doesn't exist. And, you know, Pascal says it would be better if we just assume that God does exist because if it ends up not being true, well, then we die and disappear and forever. Um, but if we don't believe in it, it does end up being true, then, well, from Pascal's point of view, we end up burning in hell. Um, this is not that kind of theology. Um, there's also this possibility that Pascal didn't consider with just these two binary propositions, God is or God is not, right? It could be that the truth or falsity of divine existence depends in some way on our own dispositional attitude toward the proposition. So what if God is not prior but consequent to faith? What if God is not prior but consequent to faith? So faith then is not a belief in this or that proposition. It's a way of affirmatively comporting ourselves to the mystery of being alive. And so the McGilchrist wager, uh, as, as Ian himself puts it, is that if the nature of reality is not already fixed, but rather evolving, participatory, reverberative, it is both rational and important to open our minds and our hearts to the divine in order to bring whatever it is evermore into existence. And so we use this word, God, but we should never assume we know what it means beyond our capacity to enter ever more deeply into relationship with one another and with this creative process. And so we don't need to oppose religious or spiritual faith to some rational commitment to the truth. Uh, it may be that knowing anything truly, whether in science or in other domains of human experience, presupposes this dispositional trust that this living reality may be responsive to our epistemic intuitions and to our ethical intentions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Matt. And Zach, we'll welcome you back first and then we'll make our way around the room. Thank you. Hi. Um, so for Carolyn and Matt, you've kind of offered these renovated definitions of fiction and truth that are very beautiful to spend time with. And I'm curious if you have a definition of falsehood or fall, something, something being false. Cause I was thinking about how you brought up Matt, the sky is blue. And if I were to say, well, the sky is red, if that was in a piece of art before me, there's a way that that would express some kind of truth or reality. But then in another dimension, that's false. And I don't know how to describe that now. So I need you. <laughs> Very good question. Whitehead says it's more important that a proposition be interesting than that it be true. And he adds that usually it's the true propositions that are interesting, but sometimes a false proposition, the sky is red. It might not feel relevant now, but what was it, 2018, when the sky actually did turn red here in the Bay Area? Um, Mars might may have had a blue sky once, if there were creatures there who could see in color, but um, false propositions introduce novelty into the world. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference between a falsehood and a lie. Lies are intended to deceive. A falsehood is just a different way of looking at something that may become true if it is interesting enough to propagate into the future, right? And so rather than think of falsehood as automatically wrong or bad or even evil, it, we have to wait and see, right? But a lie is different. That's an intention to deceive and manipulate. And, you know, so that's a subset of falsehood. Does that help? Right. But it seems like there's still a category of happenings that aren't happening. Well, I know you're saying something false could potentially happen. It hasn't yet. Right. But sometimes it's the, just false. I guess I'm, it, yeah, I'm trying to like. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you're giving me an opportunity to share this line from Whitehead um, from his book, Adventures of Ideas. He says, and, and this is in a chapter where he's talking about how we need to really expand our sense of truth, bring it into connection with art and the way in, in which metaphor can be true. There are true metaphors that cannot be expressed literally. Uh, but he says, apart from blunt truth, our lives sink decadently amid the perfume of hints and suggestions. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, yeah, there is a falsehood and, and, and we miss out on the blunt truth, which sometimes needs to be delivered. And a falsehood that is alighting that, uh, yeah, can be damaging. Yeah. Thank you all so much. I loved these talks. I'm over here. Um, let, uh, well, first, I just wanted to plug James Baldwin, who I think has a great answer to this question, but I'm just going to leave that. Um, then I have like probably slightly just annoying uh, comment question for Matt um, with respect to Whitehead, causal efficacy, and Kant, because I don't know if Whitehead actually says this about Kant, but I mean, sure, Kant says like cause is a concept and it's part of the understanding. But he also says that we have principles, right, which are different than causality and reason and principles can't be demonstrated. You can't make them into concepts, but they're part of our vocation and they're what guide us in life and what draws to philosophy and to respect and responsibility towards others um, and make us live in community. And um, so, yeah, we, we can't define principles and our vocations and these things. And even if we wanted to explain them, why are we explaining them? Well, because we're already under a vocation to explain ourselves to others and be in community with others and respect others and try to understand each other. So I think that Kant doesn't fall into this. He just very limits what causality means and then opens up this other thing that I would call causal efficacy with Whitehead and you. And, and I think is a completely right brain to use the language that we're talking about here. Um, reason for kind of this right brain thing, not this hierarchical left brain. Anyway. Uh, this could get heady, but <laughs> Kant did open this doorway through his understanding of freedom, where at least in our moral lives, we are connected directly to something numinous. Whereas in our theoretical attempts to know the natural world, he had this screen that comes down and we just can't access the things in themselves. But through his understanding of aesthetics, actually, and his study of the biological world, he starts to be able to see the way in which beauty is the sign of our participation in a more organic participatory reality. It's just he he like sees through the door that to, towards that possibility, but he doesn't walk through it. And so um, I didn't mean to uh, sound dismissive of Kant. I wrote a whole book about, about how important Kant is. It's over there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I appreciate that's the subtlety that you're bringing. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, we have one from Carol Richardson. Uh, she asked specifically Matt, but I'd be interested in hearing everyone's responses here. If truth entails participation, does false, falsehood entail non-participation in relation as one with or part of the larger cosmos? Or uh, does a lie entail non-participation in relation to the larger cosmos as one with it or as part of the whole? Great question, Carol. I mean, it depends. Um, falsehood may be non-participatory in the sense that it's not conforming with what has been felt uh, in the prior moment um, because it's introducing something, uh, an alternative, but it's participatory. So in Whitehead, every occasion of experience, every concrescence has a physical pole which connects it to its past which includes the entirety of the universe's history and a mental pole, which connects that occasion to possibility. And so sometimes a false feeling, which is not conforming with its past is still conceptually in the mental pole relating to the, this field of possibilities, this field of values in a way that is important. 
it's false in the strict sense that it's not conforming to what has occurred physically in the past, but it's important nonetheless. And it, so there's a participation in that realm of possibility that's bringing something new into the world that has never been before. And it might be strictly speaking false, but it's important. And lying, I mean, Whitehead will point out, and this is actually a difference with Kant when we think about morality, you know, for Kant, you should never lie, even if you're hiding refugees in your basement and someone knocks at your, a policeman knocks at the door and says, are you hiding anyone in your home? Kant would say, you can't lie because if you were to universalize that, de universalize that deed, then it, it's basically saying everyone should, can lie whenever they feel like it. And I don't know, Kant. <laughs> So Whitehead would say that sometimes, and it goes both ways, sometimes a lie is participating in a higher moral truth. And sometimes a truth, Whitehead says something like truth in the wrong season can be evil. Right? And so um, the short answer is it depends. <laughs> but good question. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry my cartoon video of concrescence didn't work because it would have all been explained. But um, Mike Levin earlier was talking about the, um, the continuity between anatomical morphospace, which are cells as they go through the process of differentiation and development, um, explore and the way in which that anatomical morphospace is not something like information stored in the genes. And uh, John uh, Verveke asked, well, then where is it? Um, and, you know, I've had a similar conversation with Mike and he'll talk about this platonic morphospace where these forms exist as possibilities. And so I think when we when we think about how cells are able to collaboratively generate uh, our physiology, that is at a different scale, the same thing that we do as human beings embedded in linguistic networks and not just written or spoken words, but, but semiotic networks that include gesture and ritual and all of this that Zach was speaking to, we're exploring together these higher dimensional uh, networks of possibility. And so mind, whatever else it is, is our participation in the unseen that informs the scene. I mean, what we see with our eyes is a very small sliver of of reality. And I think, you know, um, I'm a kind of Platonist, but I don't think that Plato should be read as saying that the sensory world is merely an illusion. It's only an illusion when we think it stands on its own without this plenum of possibility behind, within, around it. And so Whitehead's concept of concrescence is just um, a fancy way of describing this process whereby uh, the physical and the conceptual are constantly, always and everywhere found together in dialogue with one another, holding the tension of the actual and the possible. And that concept of concrescence can be used to understand the collapse of the wave function in quantum physics as much as it can be used to describe the uh, light bulb going off when a new idea occurs to us. It's the same process at different scales uh, occurring with a different intensity, right? And so mind is everywhere, but mind also evolves and evolution is this um, intensification so that we as conscious human beings have this imagination that allows us to engage in fiction as much as in science to explore alternative possibilities, things that we've never experienced in our physical sense world before. And so the human being becomes this conduit ingressing, in its term, into the world 
um, novelty at a clip never be before seen on the earth, certainly. And that's that's both a danger and um, pregnant with 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 possibilities that might be glorious, but that's up to us. <laughs>